we have a, a great panel here. We've got Brian Cohen from uh, New York Angels. Uh, we've got Howard Morgan from First Round Capital. We've got Sharon uh, Weinbar from uh, Scale Venture Partners. And uh, we have uh, Stephen Kahn from uh, Bridgewater Capital. And uh, so what I thought we'd do is uh, just start. So we'll just go down the line here. We'll start with you, Sharon. Uh, just a quick introduction, and then what are the kinds of things that you as an investor are sort of looking at right now? Like, as you look out at 2013, and I'll ask the, you all to think about that, what are the things that you say, this is the kind of stuff that I'm interested in as an individual within your practice? Okay, cool, go. Sure, so I'm a GP at Scale Venture Partners. We back companies that are, where the product is done and the company is scaling. That's why we have that name. Um, personally, I focus on consumer-facing tech companies. Uh, both media and e-commerce type opportunities. Um, this year in particular, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity in emerging marketplace models, especially marketplaces for services as well as products um, and things that are born mobile. Hi, I'm Howard Morgan, a, a founding partner at First Round Capital. We do as our name says first round, so early stage, as I like to say, I invest at two stages, too early and way too early. And so. Uh, uh, we, we do about 30 investments a year in, in uh, mostly internet-related technologies, a lot of consumer, a lot of advertising technology. Looking out over the next year or two, a couple of key themes we're seeing, everything's mobile, uh, personal health, personalized self, sort of monitoring what you're doing and, and your, what your body's doing, and big data, which will then analyze the stuff that comes out of the personal health and all the sensors and all the sensor technologies that we're seeing to help you figure out better ways to do things. Hi, I'm Brian Cohen, Chairman of New York Angels, uh, largest angel group uh, in New York City. Uh, we're pretty broad-based. We look at generally everything from lifestyle, health, fitness, um, a lot of digital media. Personally, I'm interested in things that make me feel good, the things I can actually touch and feel, things I can wear, things that I see around the show that relative to people in the aging and the graying of America make me feel better than I actually should. I'm Steve Kahn. I'm a, a partner in uh, Bridgewater Capital. Uh, we, we both are a fund manager uh, and an investment banking firm, depending on the uh, opportunity. Um, as Howard said, I've seen a lot of mobile um, opportunities out there. I'd say 75% of the companies we're working right with are in the mobile space. Uh, primarily what we look for is uh, opportunities that have great management teams that are uh, in a, doing something disruptive, something that is really solving a problem uh, in a unique and novel way that uh, we think uh, you know, we'll have a, a, a good growth story and a, and a good exit. So you guys chose to come to CES. We selected all of our panelists from people who were already attending um, and for various reasons. As you uh, just, and anybody can start here, uh, why do you come to CES? It's one of the largest uh, conferences in the world. It's uh, both, you know, epic and chaotic and insane. And um, I'm sure that you, none of you are want for deal flow. Um, so you've got tens of thousands of people who would love to get in front of you. W what brings you here? And maybe we'll go the opposite direction here. What, what, what brings you here, and and why, um, why CES, and um, and maybe just and w what you see the contrast between Eureka Park and the things you saw today versus what might be at the convention center itself. Um, we've come here a lot. I mean, probably 15 times over the last uh, 18 years that Bridgewater's been around. Um, you know, we like consumer plays. Uh, we, you can never underestimate the consumer's uh, ability and desire to spend money they don't have on things they don't need. Um, and, uh, we're, you know, we're <laughs> we, we, we found a lot of uh, uh, companies over the year that have, you know, really interesting products um, that we have. Um, you, you can see a path to an acquisition uh, or uh, to, to, an, uh, to an IPO or a company that are just cash flow. Uh, but consumer is a more stable uh, sort of business. Uh, than a lot of the business-to-business -business stuff when budgets get tight and uh, sequestering happens and all that stuff. Well, I've been coming. This is my 32nd uh, consumer electronics show, 32 years. Um, I started coming here as representative. I built the largest uh, PR agency for technology, and Sony Corporation was my client, so I was forced to come here. Uh, when I sold the firm, I started bringing my two sons here because it's a gadget store, and they loved it. Now they're both over 21, so they can gamble. But I'm here this year because I actually started a company and I'm actually here at Eureka Park with my own booth. So I'm an entrepreneur again with a company called Launch It to allow all these companies to announce all their stories for free and to take all the friction and disrupt the newswire business. Uh, I'm also here 32 years, uh, so uh, inertia is probably part of it. Uh, 
but have no. you left or you just stay here year round I, now? I, I thought about it, but uh, my wife doesn't love Las Vegas. We, uh, what we have found over, over that period of time, it, it gives me a good sense of what the consumers are going to be exposed to over the next year, what additional services you might want to be able to create and, and help sell to them, how that would fit into the things. I am a gadget nut, so it's always a question of, is there an interesting you know, new gadget to be here? And what I've always found is walking the edges of the show, which this year is Eureka Park, for example, lets me see what people with very little funding, but really new ideas and really novel things. So robotics and personal robotics and all that thing started out in the edges of the, of the show floor and sort of moves to the center. And 3D started out in the edges and it's now in every major booth and so on. So it gives you a sense of what's coming in the next few years. Okay, so I thought it was a long time at 10, this is my 10th year in a row. Um, <laughs> but I, I, in addition to what, uh, what these gentlemen said, I'll say one of the things that's been really useful to me over the years coming here is all the big incumbents are here, not only the OEMs, but also the big content providers. And a lot of the action at CES takes place off the show floor. And that's true for startups as well. So this is a really great opportunity for really young companies to come and present here. And there's this whole other um, non-public ecosystem of sort of mid-stage startups who are here pitching the Comcast of the world and the Fox and partnerships with Samsung. And so it's a really awesome opportunity to come and meet both the executives and biz dev people who are looking for those kind of up and coming companies from the big companies, as well as for people in the, in the investing business like me to meet those, those up and coming companies who may or may not have invested in actually being on the show floor. So, so to, the, to that end, so you're here, you're looking for trends, you're seeing interesting things. We did a quick tour, whoops, I'll leave it there, goodbye. Um, we did a quick tour of Eureka Park, um, and Howard, I think you said it best, a lot of what's interesting from a startup perspective is happening on the edges, right? So uh, I'll actually start with you. Um, what did you see that was interesting, and what advice would you have? A lot of these, well, let me ask you a question. How many of you are entrepreneurs, startup types? How many people you got startups going in the room? So, half the audience here and, uh, and more, what, what advice would you give them? So you saw some pitches, if you saw something that was interesting, talk about it and then what advice would you give either those people or the general, hey, I see a lot of this and it's a mistake or an opportunity. And I'll ask a similar question to all of you. Well, I, you know, one of the th pieces of advice, particularly when you're pitching, is uh, the, the, the marketing mistake entrepreneurs make is trying to sell me their product. Uh, what I want to buy is your shares and that's a different product. And so you've got to tell me why that product's going to make me money, the shares, which is so most people forget to tell us about market size, how they're going to reach that market, their business. They're so excited as, as I get about the product itself that they don't tell me about their business. Uh, but, but for example, we saw Troop ID, which I thought was a neat idea. Uh, and I, and, I, and you know, we did get out of them, gee, 40 million people could be affected. They, they get revenue shares, they get money. That's good to hear. Uh, we saw the, the uh, invoice now, the uh, SaaS-based model. There, the revenue stream looked kind of low for the kind of model, model. So, so it is, uh, when you are pitching me, I, what I'm buying is your shares, not your product. Peop I have to be convinced other people will buy your product, but I also have to be convinced you understand the business. That's really smart. Brian, go ahead. Well, um, so we did a launch pitch fest the day before the show started, and it was really remarkable how many of the startups could not communicate. They didn't have any documentation of any quality PR materials. They didn't have any key messaging thought out about what they were going to say. There was such an incredible lack of rigor. They came here with prototypes, you came here with good ideas, but you didn't come here with the voice to express the thoughts and, I, and the vision behind those ideas. So don't leave that at home, don't forget that. Um, so I keep seeing a lot of companies that are playing with concepts, but they're not playing with needs. And so I think there's a big chasm between the idea of a concept that looks interesting and I don't know that there's another word for cool, I just spell it K-E-W-L sometimes. Um, but something as Howard is saying, somebody will buy from you. Stephen, Sharon, any thoughts? Sure. Well, I would reiterate exactly what I heard here, which is, um, you know, th there's, you know, a product does not a company make, and um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, real interesting whiz bang technology we saw. Um, but uh, as uh, Brian said, the ability to communicate exactly what they do. I mean, we had to ask one of our guys, ten minutes or not ten minutes, three minutes into his pitch. Whoa, whoa, Tom, what do you do? <laughs> we couldn't tell from the materials, really. We couldn't tell from what he, he went right into the product and how it works, and here's what button you push. Uh, and, and that's a problem. If you're trying to get money, um, if you either have, if the, if the investor is expected to wait five minutes to hear what you do, or, you know, uh, paragraph four of the executive summary, 
they've got 40 other plans on their desk or 40 other companies to see, and, and you're not going to get you know, the kind of attention uh, maybe your product or, or, or your company deserves. Um, and but now the flip side of that is we saw a deal here called Gecko Cab, uh, and you know, within a second, it says simple as asthma management. Well, I had I had asthma as a kid. Uh, my kid had asthma as a kid. It's asthma management. It was really easy to understand. And then he really knew his market. He knew how many. He knew how much. He knew exactly how the product was going to be uh, implemented uh, uh, with their customers. And that gives comfort uh, to a guy who might spend a lot of time digging into whether or not he wants to invest or represent a company to two investors. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, again, the great advice, I'm going to go in a little bit different direction, which is when you walk around the booths here, um, being an entrepreneur is a pretty lonely job, and there are some lonely entrepreneurs sitting behind a table, staring lovingly into their, uh, into their handheld device or having lunch, and you guys paid money to come here, and it's a target-rich environment. So being an entrepreneur means you have to always be selling. You have to always be selling your product, and you're always selling your company. You're selling your vision. You're trying to um, attract talent to your organization. And if you're an engineer and you're more comfortable looking into the computer, you're going to have to push yourself to be more extroverted in this environment. So learn, learn that skill set that you can add to the skills that you already have on the technology side and push yourself to stand in the aisle and ask people questions as they walk by. You know, we're, if you have never worked retail sales, it's, you know, that's a lot of what it's like to come to a show like this and try and get attention. Your, your booth doesn't bring attention. You, the energetic person in the booth, attracts attention. I think those are really good points. I'll, I'll just add one thing to it as you guys were talking. I think I found a lot of places where you walked around and it wasn't very clear what they did and so it didn't draw you in. And an awful lot of people sitting behind the desk staring at their own stuff, which it's like, why did you bother? You know, stay, stay back in your hotel room. Um, but I, I will say that there's nothing quite like hand-to-hand -hand sales to uh, sharpen your skills as an entrepreneur. Um, we talked, a, uh, you guys all dropped some, um, I'll, I'll, I'll call them buzzwords, I don't mean it in the impolite way, but more in the trends kind of way. So um, I, I want to come back to you, Sharon. A lot of the companies that are in this room, some of them are trying to reach scale. Some of them are at that place. Some of them are earlier stage. When you think of scale, right, where in that curve, give a description of either a company that you have invested in or something you saw where you say, they're ready for scale. They're ready for that curve. Like, how do you define that? Because, uh, and I want to clarify the question a little bit. A lot of people talk about, well, I'm looking for my Series A round, or I'm looking for Series B, which that's an investment point that's sort of arbitrary. It has nothing to do with your business, per se, in terms of where you are on the stage. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Right, that's a great question. So, so we're completely indifferent to the letter the, and, and, and almost indifferent to the quantity of money. I mean, we don't do seed investments sort of sub a million dollars, but a company is ready for scale venture partners. When you are ready to scale, meaning the product is done and there's proof that the market is ready for you as well and that there's product market fit. And, the, and the, to us, the most critical way of assessing that is increasing number of customers per period, which could be increasing number of customers and increasing revenue per year, or in the case of two of the investments we made this year, very young companies, one was in revenue only for three months, an enterprise B2B company, a company called Boundary, it's cloud uh, network management in the cloud. They had been in revenue for three months, but every month they added something like double the number of customers the month before, and the customers that they had added in the prior months increased their spend rate. So that's, it's just a clear sign. The world wants to buy what this company has to sell. That's what we're looking for. It can be a $10 million revenue run rate, but it could be a sub a million dollar revenue run rate. But when the smaller it is, sort of the clearer the signal has to be and the steeper the curve has to be. So it's uh, shockingly about customers, not about investment capital. <laughs> okay, so go in the other direction. So S Steve, you, you sort of invest in the same kind of level. Do you do early stage stuff or? <clears throat> We've done a bit of everything. Now I'm, maybe I'm unique, maybe I'm not unique. I know Brian's been an entrepreneur. I've, I've, I've been where, where you all are uh, six times, raising money for myself, which is much harder than raising money for someone else. Um, and uh, so, so we, we sort of have a soft spot for, for startups and early stage companies and uh, uh, be, try to be helpful. We typically invest a little later. Uh, and uh, to, to your point that um, you know, we talk about market acceptance. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs want to tell us, well, I've got 90,000 free customers. Who's voted with their wallet? 
that your product is worth having or, or, or must, uh, must have. Um, and uh, same thing, inflection points. We're looking for capital will make the difference now. Right, you want to know that, what, that when you spend the money, it's going to make a difference in the trajectory. Right. And so, that, so Steve Blank has a really great quote, which is nail it before you scale it. And that's the get it all ready, get it, make sure that there is product market acceptance, product market so fit. Those are yeah. The, so we had one of the companies here, and I think you referenced that you know you got ninety thousand, got no ninety thousand users basically, and you had a, a I think one percent of that roughly um, uh, at the scale, and those are good metrics to show adoption. But when you go, those are very clear metrics, right? You're, when you guys are talking, you're talking. When you're doing early stage investments like Brian, you and Howard do, um, what what are you looking for? that are those signals that aren't as quantitative, right? They're qualitatively driven. Not to say that you're not looking for the qualitative factors as well, but, but you only have qualitative to go yeah, after, yeah. really. So I look at everything before the money, right? I'm not looking at the validation. Um, I like getting in before the, the idea of even, I know who's going to buy it. I like to be able to know that the person sees an opportunity, recognizes it before the buyer even recognizes they need it. That's really a thoughtful behavioral process because they've really thought about the customer and what their needs are. So I believe as a behavioralist, what do they believe the customer needs before the customer even realizes they need it? And that's so far that's worked for me. Well, we're very con uh, focused on the team itself and how flexible the team is because whatever product they come to us with, it's almost certain that by the time it gets launched, it'll be different because we're seeing it so early. So is the team flexible enough to make something change. Uh, the other thing is we want to make sure they're in a big enough market. That they've identified a segment that's big enough that if, they, if it works, there's enough money there to make a company that can get to a, a scalable, a venture scale business, which means a business that could eventually get to 100 million in revenues, could get sold in that place. A business that'll only get to 20 million in revenues, even if it's high profit, is just not really going to provide the kind of returns that a venture uh, fund of our kind needs, even though it may well be a terrific business and a terrific business for angels to own. So we want something that, that uh, we want a target market that's big enough and that has the money to spend. Well, well that's, a, that's a reality check too, is that not er these are institutional investors, right? You're at the earlier, earlier, earlier end of the stage. You're a little bit later along with like a first round outside of friends and family and, and friendly angels. And then you're up the food chain a bit and we're all over the map. Um, Sometimes your business is not going to be uh, venture worthy, if you will, and you're going to have to look at other sources of capital uh, to get your business to the level where it might be uh, backable by a professional. You know, angel investing is fun. In the research that I've done, most of the angels that I've spoke to and ask them, why do you do this, Scott? They do it because it's fun, right? So I, when I get in early, really early, it's before the mistakes have been made, so I can actually be there and work with them and offer them ideas and other people's influence so that they can get a better, clear sense of what needs to be done sooner rather than go through the mistakes too quickly. So we're, we're going to open it up for questions. I'm going to make one comment and, and, uh, 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 to Howard here. But if you've got a question, just raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. So anybody have any questions for the panel here at the moment? Come on, you're not all shy, all right? We'll go here first. I'm going to make a comment. So it's interesting. You mentioned defining your market, right? And um, uh, you know, there's seven billion people on the planet, so that's not the answer, it right? Is, it is for Mark, uh, for Mark Zuckerberg. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but but he, he he didn't start there, right? He started with college campuses yes. and really only one. Um, so when you guys think of uh, of defining that market in the early stage, and even what you're looking at when you guys get when you're looking at scalable companies, there's a, a, a you have to narrow it down. So the the asthma inhaler was a really interesting one. He said, look, there's 22 million asthma, but there's only half of those, I guess it was 10 million, and five million of them are really our customer because they have this kind of behavior to them. Um, so really, how do you look at the definition of what that customer base is? Because it, it's unlikely to be really seven billion. Um, and if, you know, it's one of those, if we only had 1% of the seven billion on the planet, we'd have a right, big business. But if, those, but if those five million will, are spending $20 a year for that asthma inhaler, that's a $100 million market. Okay, and you know that's probably still too small because he's not going to get all of it. Right. Uh, but you know you can see that they, he's got medical device reminders. So there's other medicines that people need to be reminded about. You can see extensions of that, and so that's what kind of interested me with with Gecko Cap. So even if he starts with one market and understands what that definition, the ability to go from other places, I'll come right, Sharon and then Stephen. Oh, yeah, because a lot of platform tech, pl most platform technologies to with Facebook 
start with some vertical that proves out the platform and then you extend. You can't, it's very difficult to start a company that's a open platform with no instantiation of something. But I'll say just, to us, one of the most important things when we're assessing a company and a team is how clearly do they think about those things, the target market, the pricing, that kind of stuff. So are you really realistic, which doesn't mean pessimistic or overly optimistic, but do you kind of accurately calibrate the risks in your business and the opportunities in your business? It's, and it's almost yeah. being thoughtful about it. Even if you're wrong, right. you've actually given the thought and rationalized right. it as opposed to, well, we're throwing our hands up. Steven, you want to go and then you go and then I'll go to your question. Yeah, I mean, we like to think that we add value beyond just capital, right? And so one of the th ways we add value is being able to see around corners for the entrepreneur because, you know, they're on maybe their first startup and it's their first product they developed and it's the first market they've gone after. And so they've got this really myopic view of, you know, 5 million asthma patients or whatever it is, but this is our 200th deal. And, you know, we can often instantly see um, a, a, a product extent, you know, a, a, a horizontal, they're looking at it as a vertical application, we're looking, seeing it as a horizontal application that can apply to other businesses, and they think they've got a $100 million company if everything goes perfectly, and we think they have a billion dollar company uh, if everything goes perfectly. That helps the valuation from our side. You know, as an angel investor, we would be very happy with a 3x exit. We're fine, thank you, if we could even get 3x exits. So we're not that driven towards very large market opportunities driven towards great ideas that'll be acquired relatively fast. We talk about exit strategies. Don't ignore that when you talk to an angel. If you use the word exit enough, they'll be a lot more interested in it. All right, so we'll start with a question. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll, we'll come back, back around to you. Go ahead, just introduce yourself and go Hi, for I'm it. Tony Bradley, uh, I'd like to have you address IP and how important IP is and how you structure that relationship with, uh, with deals you look at. We think uh, it depends on whether it's hardware or software. Uh, you know, w with software IP, we, we, it's usually not worth agonizing over. You should file a provisional patent, but you know, we, we don't, we nor ve ve it's very rarely something that we uh, are, are really worried about unless it's a very unique kind of situation. I, IP, I mean, IP really at? depends on how much money you've got to defend it, right? <laughs> And yeah, I, I mean, I there are some there are some segments of the market where freedom to operate is very limited because the incumbents have very large patent estates. So that would be something we'd look at. So, for example, storage software or something. It's a, it's an area that's heavily patented and heavily litigated. And so, if you're a startup in that space, probably you have to have you have to have your own IP because that's m it's as much defensive as offensive. But I would say I don't think any of us invest in IP. We invest in companies where IP is, is one, one, asset. one asset. Did you want to add something, Steve? No, I was just going to say, I think the larger question is, uh, what are the barriers to entry, IP being one of them? Because we've seen deals where the IP was kind of, you know, whatever, but, you know, they'd ha they, they had a stranglehold on the biggest distributor in the space or you know, they, had, they had distribution um, barriers to entry, or they had management barriers to entry, where they had the biggest guys in the space who knew everybody in the space. We view that as an inhibitor to someone else getting in or really gaining traction in the space. Other questions, guys? Right here, and then right here. I've noticed that most of the uh, capital investment is running away from uh, actual hardware pieces. Almost everything that I see, uh, big, exciting capital, pointed to is software, um, and is, is this just because uh, the the exciting hardware pieces are, are, are going to be iPhones and things that, you know, uh, startup companies can't do, or uh, is it just a uh, mindset? So Howard, you said you're a gadget guy, I'll come back to you. Like, well, are, you are you investing in gadgets, you just want to buy we, the ones that show up? We do invest in some, but uh, you know, we, we, we really like capital efficient companies, because if you want to make an iPhone, you, it's hundreds of millions of dollars of capital to get there. So, you know, it's, it, that, and we just can't play in that space very well. And most, most of the earlier stage and Series A venture firms won't play in that space for that reason. Sharon, the sec, you, you, just one quick second piece is that what, whatever you need hardware for today will become software on some com commodity hardware. So Arduino, if, if that makes any sense to some people. Think about radio, it's all now, it's all software defined radio. You don't build new radios. You, build the software for your radio on the exist on a DSP chip. So we're a little loath now. Yeah, I'm, I've, I've, I don't know if Howard's wearing my underwear today, but I've invested in an underwear company. It was a highly 
efficient technology that he devised for the underwear and a great new design. And the last company I invested in, excuse me? They feel great. And another one was a company that prints art. They want to be the central repository for printing the world's greatest art from the greatest art museums. Strong software component, though. Well, yeah, I mean, just hardware in general, you, you have in the semiconductor space, which used to be a very fertile venture investing space, is so intensely capital, re requires so much capital, both, you know, not so much for fabs, because everybody manufactures a TSMC, but even the tools to design the devices are extremely expensive, and the product cycle is very long, and the, again, the incumbents, it's just, it's a space where it's difficult for startups to get traction versus um, incumbents. There are some parts of the semiconductor space that remain um, available to startups because they're black art spaces where you can manufacture devices on um, fully depreciated equipment. So things like mixed signal semiconductors and analog semiconductors, those, kind, those specialty niche markets remain av available, but it's still the channels of sales then to try and sell your power management semiconductor into an HP or something still is very closed by the by the big companies, even though you can design and manufacture it cost effectively. So that's driven the capital out of those spaces. All right, we got time for one more question here, I think. Hi, I'm Arun Das. I'm a nuclear physicist and founder of uh, Dream on Demand. It's a business intelligence software company. My question is actually uh, VC funding is uh, very competitive. And uh, according to data, Silicon Valley data, about 20 to 25% company can raise VC funding. So once they get funded, this is again data, 60 to 80% of the companies, startup companies fail over time under five years. When they're funded, when they have a good team, when they have good advisors, and when uh, they have a good market and there is no shift in market. So other than these, what are the top three reasons do you think are responsible for this failing? I think you just had a nuclear physicist say you guys are in a shitty business. Um, <laughs> I'm not totally sure though. So well, why don't you explain why you think, why do, why do those companies fail? Why do the companies you guys put your bets on uh, that's a great way to to, uh, to well, close out here. I mean, I think we need another hour. Well, <laughs> I mean, not there's three is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, there's there's any number of things. I mean, you you, you could have just missed, you know, just missed the uh, the uh, the interest the market has in your product, uh, and we all maybe we all missed it. You missed it. The investor missed it. Um, maybe you had a key team member who uh, got fed up with the option package he had and he, and he left, and that was your key marketing guy. Or, um, I, uh, I, I mean, there's, I mean, it's almost an impossible question to answer. Well, it is, it is. But I, I have I have two. The, my top two reasons are. When we see a deal or an interesting deal that we go into, if, if it's the right kind of idea, there's probably seven other startups starting at the same time. So we started uh, People Link at the same time as ICQ started instant messaging. Network effects, one winner. Okay, that's one big chunk of things, and I just think that that's like the second thing is we do swing for the fences. We want to get the 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 100x returns and the 500x returns and the and the 50x returns. So we'll do deals that we know have a smaller chance of success, but if they succeed, the reward is gigantic. So the expected value is high, but there still may be a large... Yeah, I was kind of surprised you said something before, Scott. Um, you can't be smart anymore on its own, and you can't be fast anymore. You have to be smart fast. So that nimble nature of recognizing something that's not working, you've got to change at that moment. Move on, figure out the new direction. Know the customer better. It's always about knowing the customer better, more intimately. Right, right. Companies go out of business because revenue cannot cover expenses. If you can get revenue to cover expenses, That's the yes. company can stay in business. Uh, and sometimes even once you get to break even, then your business is disrupted by some other further technology or market shift. But so Smart that's lady. why you have to know the customer. And I think cus companies fail. When my younger daughter was six, I came home and said I had a bad day. Why did I have a bad day? One of my companies not doing very well. And she said, quote, what's the matter, mommy? Not, not enough people want to buy what they have to sell. And pretty much she nailed it. That's, that's why companies fail. So in, in, encoded in that means some, something about specifically what you're offering. Business intelligence is a, is a big growing market is the way you're offering the product to the, com the companies that you're choosing to try to market it to the exact right thing that they want to buy right now. 
All right, with that, we're going to wrap things up. I really want to thank our panelists. Please give them a round of applause. I really appreciate it.